Yes, let's begin once again. Uh, so before the break, we were seeing that um, Jesus took the decision that he did out of love. He knew that there are two grieving sisters waiting for him over there. And yet he chooses to stay two more days and then go. Um, we see earlier in John chapter 4, an event where you have a noble man coming for his son. He says, my son is dying. Please come quickly. And uh, Jesus just speaks a word and says, you know, uh, no, your son is going to be well. So it takes about one day for that man to ret return back home. And then uh, his servants tell him uh, that uh, your boy is now well. He asks, he inquires, at what time did my child get well? And he gets to know that around the same time that Jesus spoke, you know, in fact, the wording over there says, the hour when Jesus had spoken, that was the hour when his uh, you know, son had got healed. So it would have been so easy for Jesus to just speak a word to the messengers and say, Lazarus is going to be fine. And that's it, you know, and that in that very moment, in that very instant, Lazarus would have become well. So in love, loving them, caring for them, he chooses to allow Lazarus, you know, uh, to die for a little while. Knowing that they are grieving, he delays by two days. Jesus does not always deal with our pain and grief in the way we would like him to. But it is very important to remember that this is a good shepherd. You know, so whatever he does, he does it uh, so that his name is glorified. He glorifies his name by showing compassion and mercy and kindness. That's the description that he gives about his name, you know, in the Old Testament. When Yahweh is describing himself, he says, this is who I am. This is what my name represents. And he speaks about kindness and mercy and compassion and justice. And so out of that justice comes the you know, judgment, where he judges those who are um, uh, wicked. Uh, but it is all about compassion and doing that which is right and supporting that which is right. And so uh, it, it, it's about um, helping those who have been wronged. You know, so it's all about goodness. That is who the Lord is. And so when we are going through very hard and difficult times and we feel as though we have been left alone in our grief, it is good to remember verse 5 where it says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. You know, so specifically, each of them is named individually. Each of them individually mattered to Jesus. And yet, he chooses to handle the situation in this particular way so that his name may be glorified. And his name is the name which uh, you know represents compassion and mercy and kindness. So um, it is important that we remember these facts when we are going through our own times of trial. So now, in his scheduled time, Jesus says, let's go, you know, and uh, wake up Lazarus is how he puts it. Um, and uh, so the disciples say, no, Lord, let him sleep, because if he sleeps, then he will get well. They didn't really have the modern medicines that we do. For them, I think most of the time, all they could do is just allow the person to rest and hope that the person recovers. You know, So um, they say, you know, let him rest, Lord. Uh, and then Jesus very plainly says in verse 14, no, Lazarus is dead. And in verse 15, he says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. You know, so uh, he says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. On any occasion, when, you're, when you've been going through a trial and you feel as though the Lord was not there for you, remember that it is for your sake that he has permitted a certain event because he is the good shepherd. He is the gate you know, uh, for the sheep. No wolf can ever come near you. No principality or power can attack you as long as you are safe within his enclosure. You know, so um, it is very, very helpful for us to remember who our Lord is. He is the shepherd who is the gate. He literally is uh, lying there as a shield.
between us and the evil one. So whatever he permits it, he permits it for our sakes so that we can, be, we can grow into his image, so that we can have the a reward which he has already prepared for us, so that we can have the future that we are meant to. You know, these are um, uh, assuring things that we can you know, remind ourselves of when we read uh, this passage. So, um, um, so he says, nevertheless, let us go to him. And we have this beautiful words of Thomas. You know, he says, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> because, you know, Thomas is very sure that the 12 hours of daylight are, are, you know, Jesus says the 12 hours of daylight are still there. Don't worry, we won't stumble. But, you know, Thomas is not, not at all sure about that. He's pretty convinced that they'll all probably get killed. But look at his loyalty. He says, it's all right. If Jesus is going, we'll also go with him. If we have to die, so be it. You know, and so they all come back over here uh, to this place. And um, so in verse 17, we are told that it's already now been four days that the um, body has been kept in the tomb. Uh, so now, OK, if we can have someone read out uh, from verse 18 uh, up to verse 20. Yes, uh, John chapter 11 verses 18 up to 20, please. Verse 18. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, was, now Martha as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Yeah, we get the impression that these are uh, well-known people, a well-known family, because you know Jews have come all the way from Jerusalem to be with them in their time of uh, grief. Um, they're also probably a little wealthy because later on, you know, Martha is able to, um, um, I mean, Mary is able to pour that expensive perfume uh, on Jesus. Uh, so I think they're probably a well-off, uh, you know, family. Uh, so you have a lot of Jews who have traveled those two miles. Uh, from Jerusalem to come and be here with these people. So there's a large audience. I mean, there are many people gathered over there who are going to be witnessing what's going to happen next. Um, verse 20, it says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Uh, but Mary was sitting in the house. But that's because, you know, Mary still does not know that Jesus has come. Only Martha hears about it, and she immediately goes out to meet him. Uh, generally, when there is a death in the family and, you know, the mourning is going on, um, the family stays indoors, you know, stays there at, in the house. And it's the people who come and, you know, uh, pay their condolences and, uh, you know, comfort them. But here we see um, Martha, you know, her respect for him uh, is so great. She goes out, even though she's the one mourning, uh, you know, she goes out to meet him. And uh, this is the conversation that takes place. Uh, so uh, uh, if we can read out all the way from verse 21 up to verse 27. 21 to 27, please. Verse 21. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Yeah. So here we see uh, Martha saying, uh, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, so, um, um, so she is very disappointed uh, that, you know, her brother uh, could not be healed. But... This has not shaken her faith in the Lord uh, because she says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. 
it almost sounds like as if she's going to be asking him for you know um, the, the uh, resurrection of her brother but that is not really uh, her thought because um, she's only thinking about his resurrection in the last day on the judgment day she is not thinking about his immediate resurrection now because later you know uh, she says by now the body will be stinking so we should not be opening the tomb so she is not expecting an immediate resurrection at this particular time uh, so where, what does she mean by the sentence then but i know that even now god will give you whatever you ask so she is saying even though things did not go for us the way we had hoped i still believe that you are god i still believe that whatever you um, ask the father it is given to you so in, in in a sense she's just declaring and saying that i still believe lord in your divinity i believe that you have come from the father and that whatever you ask from the father it is always given to you jesus on the other hand says your brother will rise again and she says yes lord i mean i know that because i know that you are uh, uh, from god so therefore on the resurrection you are, on, on the day of um, uh, the judgment you will resurrect him so she does have this assurance but jesus again emphasizes and says i am the resurrection and the life and so he you know is making the point the one who believes in me will live even though they die and uh, uh, so she so he says do you believe this she does not catch what he is saying she just simply again repeats and says uh, you are the messiah the son of god who is to come into the world so she has understood his messiahship most clearly she believes that he is from god and whatever he asks of god it will be granted to him she has understood all of that but she has not grasped all that he can be for her and for her family you know so this can happen to us you know we we know the lord we love the lord we have been learning from the lord and growing in him but have we caught all that he is you know um we may know it intellectually but i mean uh, has it become so real to us uh, that now we are walking in that and we can you know um act it out we can practice it uh, so um, you know even as i'm saying these words i am also very much in the learning process there are things which i still know intellectually though there are things which have not yet become so much a part of me that i can just open my mouth and claim it and it will be so so that is something that we are all growing into that is why it is so important you know when jesus says abide in me and you know then i will abide in you and then it says you will bear much fruit so this fruitfulness comes from the level of abiding that we do so um uh our aspiration should be to always become more and more uh, connected to the vine you know to stay in him to know him deeper and deeper because then we start bearing much fruit fruit even to the extent of you know being able to raise the dead uh, all that comes out of that abiding way literally the sap of the vine you know it it uh, the, the the sap the that life giving sap which is there in the wine it flows into the branches uh, so uh, uh, this is something uh, the this is a level that martha had not yet reached and uh, so you know we all need to aspire to grow more and more into the lord where it where it, the things which are told about him in the scriptures no longer remain as information in our minds but become such a uh, part of us that you know it literally flows out of our lives uh, so so uh, moving on to verse 33 it says therefore when jesus saw her weeping and the jews who came with her weeping he groaned in the spirit and was troubled okay so we will see shortly later that he groans again for a second time and that's for a different reason but over here the first time when he groans it is because of this he sees her weeping he sees her broken heart he sees the jews weeping the ones who had loved lazarus known him personally maybe even from childhood they had known they had known him they are all weeping when he sees the pain of all of that it says he groans in the spirit and he is troubled 
uh, the two words that are used over there, the Greek words that are used over there are very strong words. The first word, uh, when the word which is used for groaned, that is um, a complicated word in Greek. Not very sure how to pronounce it. Embrimaomai or something of the sort. Okay, So now basically that word, it almost indicates anger and indignation. So it's not just a word which talks about sadness. This is almost an angry word. That is the word. So that, it is that kind of a groaning. It's like a groaning of indignation and anger. And the second word, uh, that would be the word troubled. Um, and um, in, uh, in, in, in Greek, that, uh, that indicates agitation. Where something is literally being stirred up, you know, uh, that's the word which was used earlier in John chapter five, where they had this myth that someone came and would, you know would come and some angel would come and stir up the waters, you know, where the where the waters are literally shaken, uh, where you can vis visibly see the waters being shaken. That same word which is used in John chapter five verse seven, that's the word which is that, which is that is being used over here. So he is groaning. Uh, and the word used over there indicates anger and indignation. The second word is saying that he is troubled. And that's a word which talks about deep agitation where you're being stirred up. This is his response when he sees Martha weeping and all the Jews who cared about this family weeping. So is he angry with them for weeping? Is he feeling that they are not placing their faith in God? And so is it that kind of an anger? No, because you see what two verses later, he too weeps. Uh, so it's not the weeping which is causing him to feel so indignant and angry. He is in fact angry at sin and death and the works of the evil one, which are causing these people to suffer as they are suffering. You know, so he is so indignant on their behalf. He is so... Um, hurt on their behalf. He's agitated that they are being subjected to all of this. And uh, so it's such a, such a lovely thought you know, to carry away um, when we are having our time of pain and grief and we are weeping. What we had hoped for did not happen. Things did not work out exactly the way we wanted. The shepherd permitted certain things to come through the gate. You know, and uh, so uh, we've had to go through some period of uh, some season of pain. And then when we are weeping, this is God's response. He did not approve of what was done to us. You know, or the, whatever the evil one did to us and our family, he did not approve of it. He permitted it for our sakes to glorify his name in some manner. So he, they, good will come out of it. You no, know, we can have that assurance. And while we are going through that pain, he doesn't just sit back and say, oh, you know, the good is going to come out of it in the end. So let them suffer for a while. No, he's involved in it, in that suffering with us. He feels what we are feeling. And so he, he is indignant on our behalf. You know? So um, this is the attitude of our shepherd when we are going through our times of trial. And then uh, in verse 34, um, you know, uh, he, he says, where have you laid him? Uh, they said to him, Lord, come and see. Uh, so he wants to go to the place uh, where uh, uh, Lazarus has been uh, buried. And in another one minute or so, you know, he's actually going to raise him up from the dead. So there's really no need for verse 35 at all. Why is Jesus weeping? I mean, in another one minute, the man is going to be alive. Lazarus is going to be alive, you know. So they really doesn't seem to be any need for tears, but Jesus weeps. And this is what the Jews say in the next verse. They say, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. You know, that, that indignation, that anger, the deep agitation that he felt in his heart, it caused him to literally weep, even though he knows what he's going to do next. So you see, he participates in our suffering and our pain. He's not this uh, Greek god who is, you know, um, you know, the Greeks, they considered their gods to be stoic. You know, that's the term that they have. 
S T O I C, um, you know, where uh, the Greek gods they feel nothing. You know, they can just sit over there and just be. That is the you know, and uh, the ancient Greeks they considered that strength. So if you really want to know what strength is, you got to have feel nothing. You know, uh, care about nothing. You just are, and that's supposed to be some kind of um, uh, supreme existence. And here you have this living God who is the exact opposite of Stoic. He literally gets involved in your pain. He literally participates in what you're going through. He he's indignant on your behalf. He, he um, and even though he has permitted something, you know, for the glorification of his name, for your sake, he has permitted it. While you're going through it, he's very much in it with you. And in fact, you know, Romans eight, we we learn that in fact he's interceding for us when we are going through that whole thing. So he's not on the outside watching; he's inside with us in that trial, in that pain, to an extent, you know, where the physical Jesus weeps. I mean, this is definitely not a stoic God. This is a God who's very much involved in our lives. So beautiful to have this as our living God. I mean. What if we had a Greek God? You know, He is not that. It's such a privilege that we have, and that's why these people who stand in front of the throne of God, you know, in the in the heavens, they just can't control themselves. They keep praising Him, worshiping Him, declaring that He is holy. They just can't stop <laughs> because when they're literally there in His presence, they can see who He is with their eyes, and they can't control themselves. And that's why they go on praising and worshiping, and it's not a boring exercise because. They keep catching a glimpse of who he is, and it's like a fresh revelation to them each time they see who he is. And here, you know, when we are living on the earth, um, we don't have the direct view, uh, you know, and we are surrounded by all these trials of life, and things are not going the way we thought they would go, and we think that we are alone for two whole days. Jesus did not turn up, you know, and they were grieving over there, so they they were hurting. But this is the heart of Jesus. He cared so much about them that he wept, even though he knew that in the next one minute he's going to be raising him from the dead. And that is why, truly, truly, the Jews say over here, "See how he loved him," and it shows the love that he had for the two sisters and for Lazarus. But then you have the other category of people over here, and that we see in verse thirty-seven. You know, they are the ones with the hardened hearts. And they say, "Oh, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying?" You no, know, because you know, in the previous uh, chapter, he had uh, the the chapter before uh, last, you know, where he had um, cured a man who was blind from birth. So they are being critical, and they're saying, "Ah, if he loved him so much, he could have done something about it." But see, he didn't do anything about it. That shows that he's a hard-hearted uh, person, and he claims to be from God. See, look, look at the words that they are speaking about him, and this is what Satan says to us about our Lord when we are going through trials. You know that 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 evil voice which whispers in our ears and says, "Ah, he, you know, he's the one who's uh, done miracles. He could have done something about your situation if he had wanted to, but see, he didn't. And now, this time, Jesus groans. The same word is being used over here in verse thirty-eight. Then Jesus, then Jesus again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. So again, it's the same word. It's indicating anger. It's indicating indignation. And here, it is anger and indignation at their unbelief in who he is and what he stands for. He is a God who stands for goodness, righteousness, justice, mercy, compassion. He is not a stoic, cold-hearted God, and they are very wrongly judging him. So. When these thoughts come to us, these negative thoughts come to us in our time of grief and pain, you know, we need to cancel those. Right? You know, we need to pluck those thoughts out from the root and declare and say, "No, we know the kind of God we worship. He is a good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep." So these negative thoughts, which you know, uh, people speak, uh, the thoughts which come in our mind uh, from Satan, saying that. So oh, he he could have done something about your situation if he had wanted to, but he chose not to. That is a wrong attitude of unbelief, and it causes the Lord to be indignant and angry. Okay, so it is not a right attitude for us to have. Rather, 
we should continue to look to him in faith, trusting that he will do for our sakes. Like he says to, his, to, to the disciples, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there you know, to heal him before he died. So it, God always has his own purposes. And uh, so we need to hold on to who he is. We need to have faith in his um, uh, character, in his compassion. So we come to verse 39. Um, and then maybe we could have someone read out from all the way from verse 39 up to verse 43. Yes, verse 39 up to verse 43. Verse 39, Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped in a, with a cloth, Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Yes. So um, um, Jesus stands over there in front of the open uh, tomb. Um, and, and you have the, uh, the stench coming out of the body, which has decayed for four days, especially in that hot uh, you know, Mediterranean uh, um, uh, region. Uh, so um, standing over there, Jesus says, I thank you, Father, that you have heard me. And then he says, I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. So, you know, if you remember earlier, the Jews had said, tell us plainly who you are. And Jesus had said, I and the Father, we are one. You know, so um, now Martha had caught that concept because, you know, when, when, when she comes to meet with Jesus, she says very openly, whatever you ask of the Father, I know that the Father gives it to you. So she had caught it. But those Jews, you know, who had blinded themselves to the truth, they were not willing to accept it. So now, you know, Jesus is making it very, very plain. He's opening his mouth and he's saying, Father, you have heard me. He's not begging and saying, Father, please hear me. No, you see, there is no, this is not a prayer. This is a declaration. So here he's not praying to the Father and saying, Father, please hear me. No, he's declaring and saying, I know that you hear me. And I'm, the reason I'm saying it out loud is that the people will know that you hear me and that you do what I ask of you. It proves, it is evidence that you, I am from you. So he's making it extremely plain. They wanted him to be plain, right? He's being highly plain. It can't get plainer than this. So after having said that, you know, having shown the people that he has the father's full backing, he now cries out with a loud voice and commands Lazarus to come out. And Lazarus obviously has to obey. So even though he's all tied up you know, with all those, um, you know, grave clothes, to the best of his ability, he comes out. Uh, so it would not have been very easy to walk out with, you know, tied up in that way. But he can't disobey the command of the Lord. I mean, it's the it's the uh, the Creator God crying out and saying, "Come out!" And so he comes out. Uh, so uh, we see this happening here, and the look at the responses of the people. Okay, so um, uh, maybe we can read out uh, verses forty-five to forty-eight. Yeah, if, if someone could read out for us, uh, verses 45 to 48. Verse 45, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? 
for this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. Yeah. So we see two sets of people. There are those who cared about Mary and her family. And when they see this good thing which Jesus did for them, they believe in him. They see his heart. They see his works. They hear his words. And they are true sheep. You know, So they are able to catch the truth in what he is doing and what he is demonstrating. And they believe in him. But then you have the other category of people whose hearts are so hardened, even though they have seen the same things, they have heard the same things, because their hearts are hardened, they are not true sheep. They are not open to what he is you know, revealing to them. So they go back to the Pharisees, and they tell what Jesus has done more like a complaint. So you know, they, they want to um, kind of go and give that information to the Pharisees so that action can be taken. So then. Uh, the chief priest and the Pharisees, they call a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Now, up to this point, we have seen that on various occasions, you had the Jewish leaders and scribes and Pharisees opposing Jesus, you know, in different places. Uh, different places are named, and the people in those places, the, re the religious leaders in those different places, have been protesting against uh, Jesus and been opposing him. They've even tried to stone him on different occasions. But now, these are the top people. Okay, so now it has finally the opposition has been growing gradually, and now it has come to the top level. So here it's not just some ordinary, uh, you know, um, leaders and Pharisees of some particular region. These are the main leaders. It talks about the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. Now this is your uh, council, one of the main councils. Uh, which took care of decision making and all of that. So they gather together and uh, they have a meeting. It's rather strange. I mean, here they are uh, discussing a miracle uh, which is extraordinary in every way. And it doesn't even occur to them to you know spend about five minutes talking about this and you know asking themselves, oh, after all this has happened, Maybe we should rethink our attitude. That is not even there. I mean, that, that, that thought is not even there. Rather, they are saying, here is this man performing many signs. And what's going to happen as a result of this? Everyone is going to start following him. The they concern is that people are going to start following him. They are not happy. They are not rejoicing. They are not willing to reconsider. It shows that they have finished making up their minds a long time ago. And that is a very, very dangerous attitude. No, let us not finish making up our minds about the Lord. Each time we go to the scriptures, you know, uh, let us read it like a seeker, hoping that God will reveal something new, that God will maybe straighten up, straighten out some perspective which has, which is still slightly uh, twisted, not completely clear. There's so much more that the Lord wants to reveal to us. So let us not be people who have finished making up our minds. You know, So each day when we have our quiet time and we go into the Lord's presence, let us go with a heart that is willing to learn. Let us go like as true sheep who are ready to hear his voice, who are uh, willing to maybe readjust our thinking and our perspective and our opinions. You know that, uh, so that would be helpful. Here, on the other hand, in this meeting, these people have already finished making up their minds that they want to stay in power. And so uh, nothing else matters. Uh, what matters is that they should be able to hold on to their power because that's that's what they are concerned about. Uh, they, so in, say, in verse 48, they say, if we let him go on like this, go on like what? Continue to perform miracles, continue to help people, continue to heal and deliver. If we go on letting him do this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Now, why should it matter to the Romans whether the people are following Jesus or whether the people are following the Pharisees? As the, the Romans, as conquerors, all that really matters to them is that you know, they should get their tribute uh, on a monthly basis. The taxes and the tributes and all of that should come to them. 
and there should be peace in the land as long as there's peace in the land and, the, and their subjects are behaving and staying uh, you know calm uh, and giving the money which they are, which is due to the romans it doesn't really matter to the romans whom they believe in whom they follow so why are the pharisees saying over here the romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation the romans will only intercede intervene and they will uh, you know uh, take away the temple and nation if there are riots if there is rebellion if there are uh, if there's a lot of unrest and you know military action is called for then they will come in and take away the temple and the nation but jesus never preached violence jesus followers were in fact peaceful people they were not rioters so exactly who is going to be initiating all these riots and rebellion the pharisees themselves because you see when everyone starts following jesus they will have to go and stir up the crowds they will have to create opposition to uh, so that people will go and fight against the followers of jesus and then there will be rebellion then there will be confusion then there will be need for military action and the romans will have to step in and take some serious steps so it's rather very uh, you know foolish it's going to be these leaders who are going to be stirring up the rebellion and they are the ones who are going to be causing unrest and why are they going to be taking this drastic step because that's the only way they can somehow create enough opposition to to shut down jesus it's, that's that's what they want it shows the level of desperation for power i mean these people have become blind to everything else all they want is to hold on to their temple and nation not because they care about the temple or the nation but because they want to hold on to power um it's a um, it's a very um, terrible serious attitude you know that they have chosen to take up and uh, so now you have the high priest speaking up you know this is the high priest this is not one of the priests this is not just one of the you know um the lower officials this is your highest spiritual leader in the land uh, you know because um, the high priestly hood it comes down from aaron uh, so this is the highest post the you know uh, spiritual posting a uh, person can hold in the jewish nation and this man who is at the top he speaks up and this is what he says uh, so yeah if we can maybe read out verses 49 to 53 please uh, 49 up to 53 was 49 and one of them kaifas being high priest that year said to them you know nothing at all nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish now this he did not say on his own authority but being high priest that year he prophesied that jesus would die for the nation and not for that nation only but also that he would gather together in one the children of god who were scattered abroad then from that day on they plotted to put him to death okay so um the in the meeting the people the leaders are agitated and they say oh my everyone is going to start believing in him and once that happens you know we will have no other choice but to step in and when we step in there will be violence and then the romans will come and take away our temple and our nation what are we to do and this is the solution which the high priest offers he says it is better that the man dies because if he dies then the you know, whole nation will be safe uh, there will be peace uh, and uh, so when he utters those words and he says it is better for one man to die for the people uh, than that the whole nation perish he is in fact declaring and saying that this person will die for the people he will die for the nation and so out of his mouth out of his rather <laughs> sinful mouth this word of true prophecy comes out so sometimes god uses unholy uh, instruments to fulfill his holy purposes so um yeah and that is why it, you know it it emphasizes that in verse 51 and it says i uh, you know john emphasizes over there in the rights he says uh, caiaphas did not say this on his own 
but as high priest that year he prophesied that jesus would die for the jewish nation so even though this high priest was completely corrupt completely evil because he is holding that particular position of high priest god speaks through his mouth and declares that jesus will die for the nation and not only for the nation but also for all the other scattered children of god uh, because jesus had already declared and said there are other people and they also i will bring them and they also will be part of my flock so we can be in positions in ministry and we may have gone far away from god the way caiaphas had but because we are in that particular position in ministry god may continue to use us so just because things are going well in ministry it is wrong to just assume that oh everything's right between god and me no we should humble ourselves and every day when we go into his presence we need to examine our hearts and say lord if there is any wicked way in me you know please show it to me bring it to light so that i may repent so that i may change this is a process that we need to go through on a daily basis because in a lot of cases god allows uh, the person to, to continue doing well in ministry because that person has so many people under him and so god wants to impart uh, you know so much to those people and so god continues to use this corrupt person simply because there is no other leader positioned over there at that particular point of time and so even though the man himself is corrupt that gifting which has been given that ministry gifting that has been given god continues to use it to cause the people who are there to be blessed you know all those sheep who have come over there innocently not realizing that this man that this leader is an evil leader you know just to help them god continues to use that person in that ministry position but he himself may have gone far away from god so that could happen to any one of us so that is why it becomes vital that every day we go back into his presence and we make sure that we are attached to the vine that we are abiding in him that we are remaining in him and that his, and his words are remaining in us are we following his words are we practicing them are we living in line with uh, what his word upholds because only then will we be true uh, ministers okay so um, uh, we should be careful that just because things are going well in our ministry we should not just automatically assume that things are right between god and us it is good for us to examine ourselves in his presence every single day this is something that all of us must do uh, you know however powerful and great our ministries may be all right so um, um so the now the leaders begin to plot uh, for uh, the top leaders are now plotting for jesus death okay so earlier it was just uh, a little bit of opposition here and there but now that you have the main leadership itself involved uh, now the hour of jesus crucifixion is drawing near and uh, so um, if we could have someone uh, read out verses 54 onwards uh, you know up to the end of the chapter we only have a few verses left yeah so if someone could read out verse 54 onwards please verse 54 therefore jesus no longer walked openly among the jews but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called ephraim and there remained with his disciples and the passover of the jews was near and many went from the country up to jerusalem before the passover to purify themselves then they sought jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple what do you think that he will not come to the feast now both the chief priests and the pharisees had given a command that if any one knew where he was he should report it that they might seize him okay so now the uh, re- the leaders have issued orders saying if any one gets to know exactly where he is let us know so that we can arrest him uh, so knowing all of this 
Jesus has chosen to withdraw from public and he is now uh, hidden away in some portion uh, in the wilderness. Uh, so it says instead he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim where he stayed with his disciples. So Jesus knows that once he goes you know, to the Passover, uh, you know, um, the events are going to start uh, rolling one by one and his crucifixion is going to take place. So now he wants to spend some time with his disciples and talk to them, teach them some final things that are very, very important. So, I mean, from now, you know, the next few chapters, he's going to be giving, imparting important, vital teachings to them. So uh, now he's staying in this village and he wants to uh, prepare them for the ministry which they are going to do. Because now his ministry on earth is coming to a close. In future, his ministry is going to be only a ministry of intercession, where he'll continue interceding for you know all of his sheep uh, in, in the heavens. But his earthly ministry is coming to an end. And the full-fledged ministry of his disciples is just going to be beginning. So he wants to prepare them for it. And so um, John is going to be devoting uh, you know, the, uh, the next few chapters uh, to some very, very important things that Jesus spoke to them, imparted to them. And so we, as his disciples, also need to catch these teachings. So you know, the chapters which, which will be coming uh, later, uh, I mean, now onwards, these are all very important chapters where Jesus uh, imparts very vital truths to his disciples to prepare them for the ministry which is ahead. All right. So uh, this is basically how the uh, chapter closes. Uh, so um, yeah, if anyone has any questions at all, uh, you could maybe you know raise a hand, post it in the chat. Otherwise, uh, we can close with a word of prayer. Yeah. OK, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much that you who are the eternal, infinite, uh, almighty God, you chose to be a loving and compassionate God. I mean, Lord, you could, you don't need to be anything. I mean, you, you are, uh, you are all, and no one needs to dictate to you who you should be. And yet, in your heart, you chose to be compassionate towards us. You could have chosen to be uh, just almighty and express your power. You could have chosen to just be all powerful and impose yourself upon us. But Lord, you chose to take an attitude of compassion and mercy and kindness towards us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your great love, O oh Lord. Lord, it shows who you are. That at your very core, O oh Lord, you are the God of compassion and love. You are holy, set apart. There is none like you, O Lord. None can compare with you. The level of your set apartedness, your holiness, O Lord, is, um, is, 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 is beyond description. So, O Lord, in you, you carry all of love and what love is meant to be. In you, O Lord, you carry all of wisdom and all that it involves. And someone like that, O oh Lord, that eternal God has chosen to become our personal shepherd. What a privilege we have, O oh Lord, that you, instead of staying on your throne, chose to become our shepherd and be our gate and shield us from the evil one. And we can go in and out through this gate and find pasture, is what it says in John 10. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you have chosen to be that kind of a God, even though you could have been anything, anyone, because you are all in all. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you have chosen to have this kind of an attitude towards us, in spite of our sinfulness and our imperfections. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your great mercy and love. And so, O oh Lord, the least that we can do because of who you are, the least that we can do is offer ourselves as living sacrifices so that a pleasing aroma will rise up to, uh, to you from our lives, our choices, our daily sacrifices. Help us, O oh Lord, to live lives that honor you and please you, O oh Lord. Enable us, O oh Lord, to be sheep 
who are so responsive to your voice, to your correction, to your encouragement, and we cause us to hold on to you, O Lord, in faith. Thank you, O Lord, that you will do all these things in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, and we'll meet again next week. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.